Well, then we've, we've been taken into David's perspective about Saul. What we haven't been given is Saul's perspective of David, except as in the view of a jealous human being who has found that God has left him in a way that he's left him, um, in a way that God never leaves us now. But we appreciate that. That's a very important thing to understand, that when, when David can speak of, take not your Holy Spirit from me, it would be not a prayer we would ever utter, since God would never do that. So it's important for us to know that's permanent. This Holy Spirit has come and been permanent with us. But uh, if from David's perspective, we've been watching how this looks. Sorry, um, I'm just wondering... Oh, sorry, Jeff. Yeah, yeah, I was just wondering. Like, I've wondered about that with the Holy Spirit and in the Old Testament and you. Um, it comes and goes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but in terms of David, like the, the kings, they were obviously anointed with the Holy Spirit, so they had that given to them. Um, so... They're anointed with oil. Oh, well, the Holy Spirit came upon them. Well, it says yes, it in does. different cases it yeah. you know, was in them, some that came upon them. And, yeah. um, but he could depart, as he does from Saul. And David obviously prays that he thinks it's possible. So isn't that the same in the New Testament, though? No. Now, in the Old Testament, uh, as we see in the garden, God comes and goes, comes and goes. God is not present or omnipresent to Adam and Eve. Yeah. He turns up and goes away and turns up and goes away. And, and in the whole of the Jewish history, God comes and goes. Uh, he speaks through the prophet or he doesn't. Uh, he announces things when he's called upon uh, to, when, at the casting of the dice with the Urim and Thummim. Well, then uh, he will give an answer. But he can be spoken to by a believing person who's looking, as David does, with Abiathar. But uh, no, the Spirit of God comes and goes. Whereas with us, he comes to stay and mm. never depart. One, one scripture we usually struggle with is like the Hebrews, is it Hebrews 7 or mm -hmm. Hebrews 6, yeah. where it talks about, um, you know, those that um, basically experience the heavenly gift and mm. all those kind of things. Mm. And If they turn away, yeah, they cannot be yeah, yeah. restored to repentance. Yeah, we've kind of struggled with that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Could we take a look at that sometime? Sure. Uh, yeah. Tonight, if you wish, uh, but... Um, I want to develop something tonight which okay. will be helpful to considering that very question. But cool. Let's put that on the table. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 6, 4 and following uh, is a tricky text in the context of its setting. Mm. Oh, by all means. But it wouldn't, there would be no place there. I, th I don't think the text says the Spirit of God is taken away from the person. He never leaves us. Once he comes, he never leaves. Uh, we'll come to that. Okay. okay. <clears throat> In 1 Samuel 25, uh, we begin with the words, Then Samuel died, and all Israel gathered together and mourned for him and buried him at his house in Ramah. Uh, David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. Now, it's worthwhile noticing that um, we have already heard this, really, in 23-24. It can't be right, there's no 24. It, um, no, I think, I think it'll be further on, just a minute. I reckon it'll be 25-27. No, it won't be. <coughs> 29. Well, somewhere in the bottom right-hand corner of the page, there should be a repetition of this. No, I'll come back. I'm obviously not on, not on track. Okay. Uh, anyway, Samuel dies here, and they bury him, and this tells us as readers that we are now coming to a very decisive place because the absence of Samuel uh, is, in fact... Um, Excuse 
excuse me, let's go back to 1 Samuel 25. <laughs> ah, here we go. Then Samuel died, and all Israel gathered. Yes, that's right. Now look at 27. No, no, I'm not right. Oh, my goodness, I'm having great difficulty one day. No, no, okay. I'm sorry. 1 Samuel 25. <clears throat> We're told there was a man in Man whose business was in Carmel. Now, this is not Mount Carmel, where Elijah challenged the, uh, the prophets of Baal. This is not there. This is southern section down towards Ziklag and towards the uh, latter part, <coughs> southern part <coughs> of Israel, but the northern part of the, of the, of the desert. Uh, this man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. That is very rich. Uh, he, he, as, a, as, a, as a grazier, this man has an enormous herd. And, uh, and it came about while he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the sentence isn't finished. <laughs> because verse 3 intersperses. Now the man's name was Nabal, which means uh, not fool, but silly. A, a, bit, a, a bit silly. And uh, his wife's name was Abigail. The woman was intelligent and beautiful in appearance, but the man was harsh and evil in his dealings. And he was a Calebite. From the point of view of the court writer who wrote 1 Samuel, People descended from Caleb and in the southern sector are really roughnecks from the out there country, such as you have. Redneck country is uh, what we would call that. What is redneck country? It's, uh, well. Westies. It's west, yes. Wild west. <laughs> such as you might have here. here. Yes, that's right. <laughs> well, David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. Everybody knows that when you're shearing sheep, you're collecting and you're doing very well, and uh, this is when you, when, this is pay, this is pay all the time. And so he turns up, and he sent ten young men, and he said to the young men, go up to Carmel and visit Nabal, and greet him in my name, and thus you shall say, have a long life, peace be to you, and peace be to your house, and peace be all that you have. Now, I've heard that you have shearers. Now, your shepherds have been with us, and we have not insulted them, nor have they missed anything all the days they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favour in your eyes, for we have come on a festive day. Please give whatever you find at hand to your servants and to your son David. So this is an appeal for, uh, for not so much for funds, but for food and for sustenance. Uh, but he's making it very clear, we've been watching over your flocks, old boy, and you, <laughs> you have not lost. Part, part of this festive day is that you, your flocks have done very well and you haven't lost them. It's interesting to have it. How he sets up, the writer sets the story. He says, mm -hmm. um, now there, there was a man, uh, and the man was very rich, and he had 3,000 sheep, and 1,000 goats, and it came about. Mm -hmm. So there's that very quick punchy, yes. very punchy, and then now the story elaborates, because the, the central issue is what the writer's trying to get at, is the, the change between him and Nabal and, and Abigail. You're absolutely right. And, and once it takes place, he does the same punchy business. He brings it to a conclusion. Mm. You're right. That's is highly crafted material. <coughs> As we've seen with... Remember we saw that the book Esther... Or, uh, excuse me. Um, Ruth was a book highly crafted. Not, not a word out of place. Very, very highly put together piece of narrative writing. Well, David's young men come and they spoke to Nabal, according to these words, in David's name. Then they waited... But Nabal answered, answered his servants, answered David's servants and said, Who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? Well, there are many servants today who are breaking away from their master. So he treats David as a runaway slave. Shall I take my bread and my water and my meat that I have slaughtered for my shearers and give it to men whose origin I do not know? So David's young men retraced their way back and they came and told him according to these words. He said, everyone should gird on his sword. <laughs> uh, so each man girdled on his sword, and David also girdled on his sword, and about 400 men went up behind David, while 200 stayed with the baggage. One of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he scorned them, yet the men were very good to us, and we were not insulted, nor did we miss anything as long as we went about with them while we were in the fields. They were a wall to us, both by night and day, 
<clears throat> all the time we were with them tending the sheep. Now therefore, no one consider what you should do, for evil is plotted against our master and against his household, and he is such a worthless man, no one would speak to him. <laughs> <clears throat> Tell me what you know from this. When Nabal makes the, ma makes the back comment, who, who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? What was actually contained in the message of David that would have actually sorted that question for him? Ask your young men and they will tell you. In other words, when he said, who is he? David invited him to ask his own young men, his own shepherds, mm -hmm. and therefore let my young men find favour in your eyes. So, mm -hmm. so these are two men, David with a, a charge of some, well, we've got now 600 behind him at this point, and at this point uh, he's actually saying, my young men need some victuals to eat, and uh, your young men are getting fed, uh, so we have a common interest, and your young men should tell you quite where I fit in, if you'd like to know. But he didn't. But what we do learn is one of the young men told Abigail. So they approached the wife, as, and she's obviously more approachable, and in this case they fill her in. Whether she knew or not, we do not know, but she knows now. <clears throat> well, she hurried and took 200 loaves of bread. This is not a small connection. Now, they may be little ones or big ones, but that's not, we're not sure. And two jugs of wine and five sheep already prepared and five measures of roasted grain and a hundred clusters of raisins and cakes of figs. So she's obviously got to where the shearers are about to be fed. Right? And she said to her young men, go on before me, behold, I'm coming after you. But she didn't tell her husband Nabal. And it came about as she was riding on her donkey and coming down by the hidden part of the mountain, that behold, David and his men were coming down towards her. So she met them. And he said, Surely in vain I have guarded that this man, uh, David had said, Surely in vain I have guarded uh, that this man has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all the things that belonged, and he has returned me evil for good. May God do so to the enemies of David, and more also, if by morning I leave as much as one male of any who belong to him. So he's envisaging a clear slaughter and, uh, and he's understanding this is the end of Nabal's um, uh, hired men and also his own. We also know, therefore, as, as readers, David is set on this course. This is very important because Abigail turns him away from this course and in this way she becomes prophetic. Although, in the poignancy of our later understanding as she marries him that she doesn't know that yet. When she saw David, she hurried and dismounted from her donkey. She fell on her face before David and bowed herself to the ground. Now this is a lady who is the wife of a man with 3,000. 3, <clears throat> this is one very wealthy woman. And she fell at his feet and said, On me alone, my Lord, may, the, may be the blame. And please let your maidservant speak to you and listen to the words of your maidservant. As you said, I'd like to speak and I'd like you to listen. And she accepts the blame of this particular situation. And if you listen, the reason she does is because she says, Please not let my Lord pay attention to this worthless man, Nabal. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. So she says, you should blame me because I wasn't there. And if I had have been there, all would have been different. Now therefore, my, <coughs> my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, since the, <coughs> since the Lord has restrained you from shedding blood <coughs> and from avenging yourself by your own hand, now then let your enemies <coughs> and those who seek evil against my Lord be as neighbours. What does that mean? What's she actually saying in verse 26? She's taking a blame. She's trying yeah. to cover for her husband. And, you know, yeah. Kind of avenging you know, yourself. Him, so yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Yes, uh, she's, but what's, she, what's her argument by that? What's mm. her view of David about verse 26? He's avenging himself, taking... <coughs> his own hand against his enemies. 
that's what he should have done, and the fact that he hasn't, she's inferred and assumed that the Lord's obviously stopped him. Yes, she's actually saying, isn't she right, that he has restrained him, that God has restrained him from avenging himself by his own hand. Right? Now, I think, she doesn't know this, she, she's Abigail and she's in Carmel. What, what do we, the readers, know? Where have we heard this language before? <coughs> Uh, no, just in 1 Samuel 24, do <laughs> No, no, our, our writer has... Where has David actually... Yes, he's saying to Saul, may the Lord judge between me and you. I haven't touched you, and you're hunting me endlessly for, for no reason I can see. That is, within myself. Uh, the writer has given us a reason of jealousy and of real despair. Saul is moving towards despair and by the end of tonight he's consulting a witch. So it's really important to understand he's gone down a slippery dip. But what's important here is uh, she is saying, I have, she, she's understood something about this. Her understanding is that the Lord has restrained him from shedding blood and from avenging himself by his own hand. Now he hasn't restrained him from shedding blood. He's been a a stunning bloodshedder since he's been a youngster. Uh, but what's important is, let your enemies and those who seek evil against my Lord be as Nabal. That is, I want, I want your enemies to be looking foolish. I don't want you to be doing this. So 26 contains her argument. And she says, now let this gift which your maidservant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who according to my Lord who accompany my Lord. And please forgive the transgression of your maidservant. She doesn't apologise for her husband. Why is that? Because she cannot. Remember, it's the reverse under Torah. If a woman makes a vow, her husband can cancel it quickly if he hears it. So she can't undo Nabal's stuff. What she can do is take the blame herself and then ask for forgiveness for herself. This is one astonishingly shrewd and wise woman. <coughs> uh, she's working within her culture, true, but, and that's why she's bowing to the ground. And what she's actually saying is, forgive the transgression of your maidservant, for the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house. Now she's beginning to speak as a prophet. Because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord, which tells her, does this what she knows, or is this God using her mouth? Uh, and evil shall not be found in you all your days. Well, we, we later readers may understand that in a different way, but she, she, that's what she wants for him. And should anyone rise up to pursue you and seek your life, code for Saul, then the life of my Lord shall be bound in a bundle of the living with the Lord your God. It's a very beautiful expression. His life will be bound in a bundle with the living. And he will, and, uh, but the lives of your enemies, God will sling out as from the hollow of a sling. And it shall come about when the Lord shall do for you, my Lord, according to all the good that he's spoken concerning you, and shall appoint you ruler over Israel. Well, she's obviously now drawing off material she's heard. That this shall not cause grief or troubled heart to my Lord, both by having shed blood without cause and by my Lord having avenged himself. So she's actually saying, you do not have a cause here. Um, and she doesn't do anything... In a, now, she understands that her husband's a fool. Uh, most women who are married to a man who's a fool understand that. Uh, so she's... Uh, but she's not dishonouring to him at one level. What she is saying is, I should have been there, I should have got it, and if I had have been, I wouldn't have uh, done what he did. So this is an extraordinary event. This is a woman not countermanding her husband, but actually apologising for her absence when the, man, when the young men came. She, dis she deals with David entirely on the basis of herself. David said to Abigail, 
Blessed be the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. And blessed be your discernment. And blessed be you who have kept me this day from bloodshed and from avenging myself by my own hand. Which of course is the very thing he got upset with Saul. <clears throat> Nevertheless, as the Lord God of Israel lives who has restrained me from harming you, unless you had come quickly to meet me, surely there would not have been left to Nabal until the morning light as much as one male. So David received from her hand what she had brought him. And he said to her, Go up to your house in peace. See, I have listened to you and granted your request. What was her request? <clears throat> she asked that he would listen, but what was her request? Accept the gift. Sorry? Ex accept the gift, the provisions. <laughs> accept the gift. Well, he does. Yep. She's also saying something else, isn't she? What does she show herself to be here by the way she speaks? Does she understand that God, is, God has given this man to rule? She does. Has God said some things about this man? She, which she is in knowledge of. Yes, she does. And what is she preserving for this man? The purity of his reign once it's established. She's aiming for a clear, pure future where there's no regrets from the past. Needless bloodshed. Yes, exactly. And, and to avenge himself. That is the greatest problem for anybody that God appoints or anoints is that he will then confuse himself <coughs> with the cause of God. Well, avenging himself <coughs> with Nabal as a, as a fool mm. is a culpable thing, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. He's like a bit insane, so totally justified. Yeah. And he didn't listen. If she didn't do that, she would then suffer the fate of her husband. Yes, <laughs> yes, some people could argue that. Uh, although David has declared himself to be prepared to take the men. Mm. Well, Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he was holding a feast in his house like the feast of a king. Da 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 da. <laughs> and you, you understand the choice of words by our narrator. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunk. And so she did not tell him anything at all until the morning light. But it came about in the morning when the wine had gone out of Nabal that his wife told him these things. And his heart died within him so that it became as a stone. Uh, you have to think about that expression after you've read the next couple. About ten days later it happened that the Lord struck Nabal and he died. Our writer obviously understands God has avenged his comment to David and he's done it to the man alone, not to his men, nor to Abigail. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord who has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal. So David interprets that crystal clear as God avenging him and has kept back his servant from evil. The Lord has also returned the evil doing of Nabal on his own head. And then David sent a proposal to Abigail to take her as his wife. Uh, no one is in any doubt about this, um, uh, if you uh, think carefully. Uh, this is the way in which it's done in the East. It's a very unceremonious thing. Uh, there is no courting here, no romance. Uh, a great prince turns up and says, I'm making an offer of marriage. And her business, of course, is to obey if she considers him such a prince. So she does. And, uh, of course, with her comes 3,000 sheep. Uh, 3,000 comes a massive property, and uh, not in the sense that he owns land. That he would be a grazier. And what's important in the sense of a Middle Eastern grazier, walking over what we would call common land. But what's important to notice is that she, he has the young men, who essentially are his fences. Shepherds are what an Australian farmer might call his fences. Instead of owning land and fencing it, you have young men 
you simply take your sheep wherever you think it's best. And so you cream off the finest pasture from day to day. It's a highly dynamic uh, relationship. Just a, just a point on uh, and ten days later the Lord struck Nabal and died. <coughs> seems that in the verse before that, that um, something akin to some sort of heart condition, mm-hmm. right, prolonged, but he does die. Is that the writer interjecting, uh, God's sovereign over this, and it's actually the Lord that's done this. But it wasn't direct, it wasn't uh, like the two in the book of Acts, that mm-hmm. the Lord just directly intervenes and says, that's enough, and takes them out. Yes, I think so. Uh, the writer's made clear, I think, for us, well, he's no longer drunk, so we've got him in the cool light of day when the wine has gone out of him, as they say. Um, so he's actually thinking clearly, or clearer, than he normally thinks for Nabal at a festive time. And his wife has explained to him that fundamentally, what has she done? So he's bacon. <laughs> she has saved his bacon. That might not be the image to use for this Jewish context, but you're absolutely right. He has. That's sa- our slang. <laughs> she has saved his bacon, but in which case, what is he now seeing himself as? Betrayed. No, he's, no. he's a man standing in the judgment. Yes, he is, and he is a fool. In other words, as his name, so he knows himself to be. So he comes to self-understanding. And his heart turns to stone. Well, he became a stone. That is to say, uh, he has no warmth, no personal sense of his own vitality within him. Ten days later, the Lord struck him and he died. In other words, uh, uh, this text always will will deal with the the three things we've been seeing. And when you come to the witch of Endor, you'll see it again. The sovereignty of God, the significance of man, and the reality of the devil. You'll always see those three things put together in a, in a nice mix. And never one of the three, or two of the three, but always the three in Scripture. And here, uh, the man has come to self-realisation that uh, his wife has actually um, caused him to see his own reality. And he sees it, so that he, is, he understands himself responsible. And because, an act, because he <coughs> listens to that, his heart dies within him. He found his own inner being just simply. I don't know if this has any relevance, but um, it reminded me of when um, Paul says um, when the first time he heard the law, um, sin sprang to life in him and he died. Mm. Um, Yeah, just what you said then kind of reminded me of that where he kind of saw his folly and then his heart turned to stone Mm. and then he died. Yes. Yes, Paul's point is, I, I think, a different one, one of power. He realised that there was a power of sin which was made known to him through law, which is, will be a subset of the previous half chapter. But you're right. Uh, it, it's an awareness of self-knowledge. He's coming to understand something about himself. One of, the, one of the marks of foolish people is they don't know they are. People who are self-deceived don't know what... In the context of David, he was going to take action against Nabal, but he says here, doesn't he, he says, uh, the Lord has uh, has pleaded uh, the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal and kept back his servant from evil. Mm. It's interesting, he does not raise a hand against Saul, and yet he's prepared to uh, take vengeance Mm. into his own hand here against Nabal. And Abigail is set up as a lady that has actually mm. understood that this man is going to compromise, this, this king is going to, in waiting, he's going to compromise himself here. Yeah. And so she's actually intervened. Mm. I mean, we understand that as we read the text. The text. She wouldn't have understood that, but he's understood something. Yeah. Now the question arises, did David come to a reality that what he was doing when Abigail was speaking to him, did he come to her an understanding that this is not the right course of action? If I pursue this, I'm actually going contrary to what 
So you what? would have been taking it in some way as well. It's just not enabled. It's not so much that. He was going to take vengeance, and that's the thing. He was going to take vengeance into his own hand. So Abigail stops him wisely, but she stops him, and he's understood something about that. Uh, the Lord has, as, as, as he puts it, he says, uh, the Lord has kept back his servant from evil. Yes, he has. Can you say what, what that is? <clears throat> is it the same sin Saul is now doing? Mm. Yes, it is. Mm. It is. What Saul is doing is he's saying, <coughs> I have a competitor. It's true, it seems that God has anointed him. We, the readers, know that. <coughs> David knows that. Samuel knows that. And actually, Samuel makes that clear. Only at the time of the witch of Endor. We'll come to see that. But chapter 31. So what we understand is that we, the readers, know what's going on. And, and this is one of the things you have to deal very carefully with Scripture. Scripture is edited material, written, as we know here, well after the event, and, in the, and as we saw with Joshua, and as we saw with the book Judges. It's written at the time of the monarchy, looking back on a time when, uh, the, when, when Israel was actually, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And so what you have to do here is with always retrospective view of history, uh, it is revisionist in its understanding of history, in the best sense of that word, not the, not, not the more subjective sense that we have, it, have today. And, and what's important is that, yes, and all of us, because we have read the text of Scripture before, know that this is very decisive. She is actually guarding David's future, but he's come to understand I could have fallen into the same trap that Saul has. That is, he's made me his problem. In fact, I'm authorised. <laughs> but uh, and they, this is not a problem of Nabal um, being an authorised man. He's not repeating the circumstance of Saul, but he is repeating the underlying principle of Saul, which is what Saul is saying is, I'm a king, this dude's in my way, I need to get rid of him without asking the question, uh, wait on, I'm not a king in any sense at all, by virtue of myself, but by virtue of my position that God has caused me to be a king who cares as a shepherd for his people. Well, that's the mark of, of kingship, as you understand it in the Judeo-Christian base. Kings as tyrants and despots and dictators... That's a very different view of kingship. That arises out of a whole patriarchal piece of understanding that the man in charge is the man who does whatever he wants. It's just as simple as that. And once you have power, you exploit it. That's your business. Usually if you try, but in this case. Uh, but uh, what David is beginning to start to speak, and which Saul, had he had the understanding of it, would have also known, because Saul himself said, Who am I? That God would choose me. So it's nothing to do with choice. It's of, of the man by virtue of his abilities or his great family or his, right? Rather, it's to do with the fact that God has elected him. So we're dealing with election and rejection once again. And what we're understanding here is that Saul has now been an elected and has now become rejected as, as being king. Not, not about the man, about being king. And so in this respect, um, David is now falling into a life problem. When he starts to talk about Nabal as a man who should have known better and I'm about to take his boys out, the answer is, uh, well, then he is seeking his own revenge because he's been rebuffed and dishonoured, really. And Nabal is actually uh, foolish in the sense he doesn't know. He's not sufficiently in touch with his shepherds to even comprehend. How come we haven't had all these losses we've had? He's not even keeping a graph, shall we say. As a modern farmer might, he might not be saying, "Why is this happening?" Okay. Well, he's not a wise man. No, he's not a wise man. Well, David takes Abigail as wife, and when the servants of David came to Abigail at Carmel, um, uh, then he spoke to her, saying, "David has sent us to you to take you as his wife." So he doesn't turn up even; just sends his boys. She arose, bowed with her face to the ground, and said, Behold, your maidservant is a maid to wash the feet of my Lord's servants. So this is one humble dude, and she understands how to respond. 
When Abigail quickly arose, she rode on a donkey with her five maidens who attended her. And she, you know, she's got five maidens who attend her. She's not a, not a small dude. And she followed the <coughs> messengers of David and became his wife. <coughs> David also had taken Ahinoam of Jezreel, and they both became his wives. Now Saul had given Michal, his daughter, David's wife, to Palti, the son of Lash, who was from Galim. So the context of wives is important. Now David has in the end about six or seven wives and, and numerous concubines, but it's important to understand that he has lots and lots of children. But you should know that while he is in Hebron, um, you learn from 1 Chronicles the following things. Have a look at 1 Chronicles 10. Uh, you appreciate we're going to do this a little better when we get there, but, the, but King's Chronicles is parallel material which is actually filling the same narrative. But the chronicler is a court person. The man who writes kings is a lot more countrified. Um, but if you look at 1 Chronicles... In fact, it's just helpful if you turn up 1 Chronicles 1 and then just flick, flick the pages. We have the descendants from Adam, Seth and Enosh. So the chronicler is taking us all the way back to the Seth line. Uh, by chapter 2, the sons of Israel, which who of course is Jacob, and the 12 sons of Jacob are then listed in chapter 2 and their descendants. Chapter 3, we now have the sons of David, who were born to him in Hebron. Uh, what is this now telling you? Seth, Jacob, David. Our chronicler has got a theology of history punching through here. And we'll come to see that. This is election, of course, what he's getting at. Now, these were the sons of David who were born to him in Hebron. The firstborn was Amnon by Ahinoam, the Jezreelites. The second was Daniel by Abigail, the Carmelites. The third was Absalom, the son of Maaka, the daughter of Talmai, king of Gesher. The fourth was Adonijah, the son of Hedi. And the fifth was Shephatiah by Abital. And the sixth was Ethraim by his wife Egla. Six were born to him in Hebron, and there he reigned seven years and six months. What does this teach us? At the time he took Abigail, he had one woman in that case, uh, Ahinoam. Abigail is his second wife, but we learn by the time he's up to Jerusalem, he already has four others. And, he has an, a, and then there's a whole list of who they are. The, and then in Jerusalem he reigned 33 years, and these were born to him in Jerusalem, Shimea, Shobab, Nathan and Solomon, four by Bathsheba, the daughter of Amiel. I take it that's Bathsheba. And Ibna, Elishama, Elishama Elephalet, Noga, Nephig, Japhia, Elishama, Eliada and Elephet, nine. All these were the sons of David, besides the sons of the concubines, we're not listening to those. And Tamar was their sister. So Tamar is the listed girl among all these sons. And we know about Tamar because she gets raped. But it's really important to understand that the chronicler has started to give you a list. And his list is very significant. Sons of Judah, chapter 4. Worthwhile just pursuing this. Because by chapter 5, the sons of Reuben, and the genealogy of Reuben. Chapter 6, the sons of Levi were Gershon, etc. Genealogy of the priestly line goes on and on. Chapter 6, chapter 8, we're down to Benjamin. Chapter 7 was Issachar. So what is he saying to you? He's telling you of the 12 tribes of Judah. He started you with the Seth line. The 12 tribes, and now he's come... Um, at the end to Benjamin, and then chapter 9 of 1 Chronicles. So all Israel was enrolled by genealogies, and behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel. Aha! So there are extant documentation at the time of writing of 1 Chronicles. The chronicler is using other manuscript evidence. And Judah was carried away into exile to Babylon for their unfaithfulness. Now he's rocketed you right forward to the, to the exile itself. 
Now, the first who lived in their possessions in the city were priests and Levites and so on and so on. And then by chapter 10, uh, the Philistines fought against Israel. So he has the defeat and death of Saul and his sons. So he's taken you forward from there. So what's he actually done? First, what he's done is he's told us, the chronicler, that we've gone all the way back. He has not told you much about the Exodus at all. What he's telling you about is essentially Jacob's boys, who become he becomes Israel. And because he becomes Israel, the 12 tribes of Judah are then locked into... He's, he's slipped Samuel, slipped the judges, and he's gone into Saul, David and Solomon, the undivided monarchy. So he's actually made you a jump from Joseph, and, who is Israel, to, to David. He's actually bypassed Saul, although he'll give him one chapter to show how it came about that he was the first king, but there it is. So the chronicler has got a program, a program and we shall begin to see that when we read further. Notice, though, he rockets from there forward to the whole kings, to the exile, and then says, so I'm going to tell you something about from this to here to the exile. So you're seeing a theology of history starting to be laid out for you. And then he'll go back and fill in the whole history of this. And, of course, one and two kings will pick up this material. And if you look at uh, my reading on this, and this is off my website, you can get it, uh, is... Uh, 2 Chronicles 10, 1 Kings 14. So the King's Chronicles parallels go all the way through and what you'll see is this material will inter interweave. But it's quite important to see where this is going. And this is how we know uh, David's sons. We also know David had sons... Well, we know where these sons come from because we've got six of them already in Hebron. So what you have here is that um, she becomes... Uh, this wise woman, uh, he takes her to his, to himself. Now in 26, we're opening up an important question, because um, once we have passed 1 Samuel 25, Just take an aside to pardon me because we we don't do we keep weaving and dodging with Psalm seven um, another Psalm of David and in this particular Psalm which is uh, which has a pattern in, in my book like this. I, I think of Psalm 7 as 10 to 17. So he's speaking to God for the first 10 verses, and then he's speaking to his compatriots up to 17. That would be my diagrammatic. I, I have a schematic for all of these psalms just because it helps me when I read them myself. Uh, is the discussion going to, to our neighbours, or is it going to God? Let's have a look at this. Lord my God, this is said, this is said a, a, a Shagayan of David when he sang to the Lord concerning Cush, a Benjaminite. Lord my God, in you I have taken refuge and save me from all those who pursue me and deliver me and let he, lest he tear my soul like a lion, dragging me away while there is none to deliver. O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is injustice in my hands, if I have rewarded evil to my friend, or have plundered him who have without cause was my adversary, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it, and let him trample my life down to the ground, and lay my glory in the dust. <coughs> who is the enemy here? Do we know what we mean by that? Arise, O Lord, in your anger, lift up yourself against the rage of my adversaries, and arouse yourself for me. You have appointed judgment, and let the assembly of the peoples encompass you, and over them turn you on high. The Lord judges the peoples. Vindicate me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and my integrity that is in me. Let the evil of the wicked come to an end, but establish the righteous. For the righteous God tries the hearts and minds. My shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge and a man and a God who has indignation every day. 
God is a righteous judge who has indignation every day. <laughs> if a man does not repent, he will sharpen his sword. He has bent his bow and made it ready. He has also prepared for himself deadly weapons. He makes his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, he travails with wickedness, and he conceives mischief and brings forth falsehood. He has dug a pit and hollowed it out, and he's fallen into the hole which he made. His mischief will return upon his own head, and his violence will descend upon his own pate. <coughs> pate is an ancient word, not often used today, like the word lest, um, which is uh, top of your head. And uh, I will give thanks to the Lord according to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. What do you understand by this? What's, what's the picture? What's the follow through the word picture? What's, who is the enemy? Well, verse 4, you could read Nabal into that. Yeah. And then the enemy, you would take it to be Saul, would you not? Yes, you would, I think. But then, towards the end of the chapter, he's, is he still talking about Saul? Well, he's certainly saying there's something common to my enemies because he's designated himself as righteous. And he says, I want you to vindicate me. Mm. There's something very important about this for us to understand. Uh, let's just let's just pose a question. It's an important question to pose because everybody falls into this trap. I think, yeah, from time to time, when they read the psalm, is David a perfect individual? No. Definitely not, and, and and that's not the issue. So perfection of the Greek sort is not what we're talking about. What is he actually engaged in? He's engaged in uh, a time in his life when he has enemies that are pursuing him, and he's asking God to judge, isn't he? And he's saying, I'm quite confident, you know, Lord, if you judge and you judge my adversaries, you'll find that I have actually lived righteously in this manner and that I'm looking to you to vindicate me. Uh, my shield is with God who saves the upright in heart. He is a righteous judge and a God who has indignation every day, meaning to say that he looks upon human beings and finds unrighteousness constantly. He doesn't include himself, does he? No, he does not. No, he does not. So when David starts to talk to you, when excuse me, when David talks to the Lord and his psalms and his prayers uh, reflect that, when you read his prayers, you understand how he saw himself. That's true of all people who pray; they give away their own heart, and they and should. Because it wouldn't it be it would be crazy to talk to God with a double tongue, as if to say, "Well, I'm just an, um, you know, imagine a speaking to God saying, well, you know, uh, Lord, I'd just like to to imagine uh, a certain person who, and <laughs> and you're dissembling and tricking and uh, David says, I think I'm right in this matter. I think my my pursuer is wrong. I want you to bring justice here. My heart is right. I'm putting my trust in you. You're my refuge. Deliver me." What, what, what is the context here? And notice that he says God has indignation every day. So what does the righteous judge? Notice he does not say God punishes every day. He is not a legal view of God. He is God who is indignant. How dare they do this? In other words, what, when he says God is righteous, he says he's an indignant God who says... This, this shouldn't be, you know. So his problem, he sees God's problem with sin is one of indignation, personal affront. Not penalty at law, but personal affront. Remember how David <coughs> would say this in Psalm 51, against you only have I sinned <coughs> and done evil in, my, in your sight. Mm -hmm. And when David sins himself and he does, and this, 51 is post Bathsheba, what he's actually saying is just that, I have sinned against you. I, I, I haven't broken rules. He might have, but he isn't saying so. He's not saying I've broken the Sixth Commandment. He's not saying that at all. He's saying I have, I have sinned against you. And he understands that his view of God is... So what... Come on, where this is falling out for us. You can see it. What, David's view of God is one who doesn't have properties, doesn't have... A, a, he hasn't got a picture of God. 
He understands God's character such that it, it's not just that David's been offended or affronted, but he understands that there's a, there's a system of justice mm. well beyond himself. Correct. So he's not saying at all, I'm a special chap, yeah. and I really am your anointed, and I'm just such a wonderful dude, and you've chosen me, and I want you to just stick by me, whatever, whatever. He's saying, on the contrary, I understand you to be a God who is righteous, I, st- I take my stand with my adversary. That is, my adversary and myself are simply, we are men. But I think I'm right in this matter, and I think he's wrong. And I want you to judge between us. It's the same material you see with Saul. So the picture is one of a civil court. And he's really talking to the judge and saying, will you decide between me and my... my... Uh, my... <coughs> Correspondent. That's what I'm looking for you to do. Very important to understand this. Otherwise, you will import into this all the legality of uh, some of the things we've been studying in on Thursday nights. You will import that back into this and think this is a judicial court. No, it's not. It's a civil court. And he's got a man pursuing him. And he's saying this is not right. And I'm sure you would be indignant about this God. <laughs> I am... And I think I'm right. So he is sharing the indignation of God. Mm. He knows God's heart. In <coughs> IV says wrath. Wrath. In verse 11. In verse 11. <coughs> Not indignation. Not indignation every day. No, no. wrath every day. Okay. It puts a different spin on it, doesn't it? It's a, well, <coughs> the NIV will have that particular mm. spin. Let's take a look then at Psalm 90, verse 9, just to pick that point up. Then. Mm-hmm. 90, verse 9. Which is one of Moses' prayers. Now, what have you got for 90, verse 9a? I have for all our days have declined in your fury. We have finished our years like a sigh. Wrath. Wrath, you've got the fury. Okay. Well, the American standard runs you down to indignation. It's the same Hebrew word in both places. So we want to be pretty sure about that. KKV says anger. Anger. Yes, wrath. Yeah, wrath. Wrath, anger. Yeah. Mm. You appreciate the difference. Indignation is a personal offence. Anger could be for all sorts of reasons, judicial and other. All right, take a look at uh, Psalm 25, which is another one of this time. Notice how helpful it is to read the Psalms in the context of David's narrative. Although it's not David's narrative, but the chronicler, and in this case, Psalm 25. Psalm 25, yes where he prays for deliverance from his enemies and for instruction in the ways of the Lord, and therefore for help in trouble. Uh, my picture for Psalm 25 would be... Uh, up to 7, 8 to 15, I think is lateral, 16 to 22. And I think from... One, uh, sorry, from one to seven is to the Lord. Fifteen is lateral, and that lot, basically, between two is to the Lord. Uh, that gives you the structure and the flow. And when you look at it, it's helpful to do this diagram because it lets you say, before I read all this psalm through, uh, I'm not lost. He's going to say something to God. He's going to say something to his neighbour. He's going to say something to God. And that gives you the... Um, the, the, uh, the framework or the structure. I do this in most parts of scripture I look at, uh, where the paragraph I think is the is the unit of sense. Then it's important to see the structure and see where it's going. To Thee, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in You I trust, and do not let me be ashamed, and do not let my enemies exult 
over me. That is, they shouldn't win, should they? <laughs> um, indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed, and those who deal treacherously without cause will be ashamed. <laughs> so this is very, very straightforward. Can you see how it's important that before you begin to even think about the psalm, get the picture? The picture is, I've got enemies, and they should be ashamed of themselves for what they're doing. And they've dealt treacherously without cause. And you know what that would mean? I mean, all through your life, you would, surely you have had enemies who dealt with you treacherously without cause, as far as you can see. Notice that this is an important thing. You're not making a judgment upon people. What you're doing is telling God from your perspective. Prayer is telling God things from your perspective. You're saying, I cannot see a single thing I've done wrong here, Lord. Now you might think, who would ever say that? The answer is you're not saying it about yourself. You're saying it about the situation in which I am, as far as I can see. Now David also has other psalms, doesn't he, where he says, show me, talk to me, open my heart, tell me what's wrong. If, if I'm wrong, tell me. But, but already he is not wrong here, is he? He's already pleading with God and saying, I'm in the right, they're in the wrong, come on, deliver. <laughs> in other words, deliverance from God for David is a civil affair as well. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation, and for you I wait all day. Now this man's life from Hebron on is waiting on God all day. Remember how he said that to her, to the king of uh, Gath. No, what was that? Where he put his mum and dad. I've forgotten what it was. It'll be a place, other side of it. Moab. In Moab, king Moab. of Moab. Yeah, he says, I, I will see what God will, will have for me. What will God have for me? I'll wait. Remember, O oh Lord, your compassion and your loving kindness, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your loving kindness, remember me for your goodness sake, O oh Lord. So what's he saying to God? Am I sinless? No. Um, am I lifting up my soul and trusting? Yes. Uh, I don't expect to be ashamed then if I wait for you. Oh, I haven't done well in the past. Don't remember that, Lord. Right? So what he's actually saying is God forgets. Not because God is, of course, forgetful, but because God chooses not to remember because he is merciful. Good and upright is the Lord. Now he talks to people. Therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in justice and he teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are loving, kindness and truth to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O oh Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it's great. Wow. Who is the man who fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way he should choose. His soul will abide in prosperity. His descendants will inherit the land. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him, and he will make them know his covenant. My eyes are continually towards the Lord. He will pluck my feet out of the net. Now, come on, this man's a sinner, and he's got relationship with God and fellowship all through his life. What's he saying? What's he telling you? <laughs> He's saying, I'm living with a God who is loving kindness and who is constantly truth. So, about the truth issues, yes, I have sinned. Don't remember those, Lord. Um, <laughs> he's, a, he's, he's aware of forgiveness and he knows what that means. But he says, but my eyes are on God. I'm trusting him here. And this is where it is. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I'm lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Look upon my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Look upon my enemies, for they're many, and, let, and they hate me with violent hatred. Guard my soul and deliver me. Do not let me be ashamed, for I take refuge in thee. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. Now, what is this about? This is a man in trouble who's looking for redemption, who knows that he's a sinner, he knows that God is gracious, and he's saying, in the particular setting in which I'm talking, this is how I see it. Come on. It's all pre-Jesus, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> it is indeed. And he's got great uh, wisdom and uh, insight. He's calling for protection, for guidance, for instruction. He knows he's sinful, but he understands I'm lonely, 
and I need help and I ask you to forgive my sins and look on my enemies because they're many. Mm. Um, but his dependency is never on what he's been given to him. No. It's always outward towards God. Mm. Yeah. He's got a clear view. Mm. So can a man who's a sinner call upon God to deliver him from his enemies? Of course he can. In the situation in which he finds himself. Now this opens an important door. Is our understanding of God existential, moment by moment? Of course it is. Can you be a person... So if someone said, who are you to talk to God? You're a sinful sort of chap. You say, I'm just the sort of person who should talk to God. Because he forgives me my sins. And in this particular case, I'm right. <coughs> and I'm lonely. And I'm hard pressed by all these people. And I'm asking God to deliver me from my enemies. Notice, my enemies. So is it possible to have enemies that are with reference to yourself? Yes. Is it possible to have people who are sinners like yourself? Yes. Can they be your enemies? Yes. <coughs> God be our judge. Let God be our judge. So what does this tell us? There's a very important question. Second World War. People on two sides of the channel praying to the same God saying, give us the victory over the Germans. My God, give us the victory. And the Germans are saying, we are calling upon you with great hymns. Tell me what we're hearing here. <laughs> I've set you an Aunt Sally because a Second World War is bigger than David's personal agenda arena. This is about a personal arena. <laughs> well, this is such an important thing to understand because it is, it is true, though, isn't it? That with David, he understood himself to be the Lord's anointed. Yes, he did. Right. When he has enemies. <coughs> when he has enemies who would bring him down, they're actually standing against the Lord's anointing. He's understood that. They are. So they become God's enemies in that sense. Mm. Um, Does he refer to them as such? In the Psalms? Mm. As in, your enemies are my enemies? Yeah. Yeah. That idea? No, no, Eric's right. He, he, uh, he, uh, as far as I've read the Psalms, I don't think he does that. I think what he does say is, I do have enemies. Mm. I'm not saying I'm perfect, and I'm not saying I'm not a sinner. Mm. In fact, that's the whole point. I think you're merciful and righteous, and you are kindly to us. And you, don't, you, don't add, you, don't, you don't keep these scores for us. Mm. But if that's the case, what says he understands? Can a sinner call upon God for deliverance of enemies which are brought on the basis that he is God's person. I'm thinking of Jesus. Now. The reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. And this happens to you and I all the time. If you, if you live as a Christian, you will find that people hate you. And they hate you, in your view, without a cause. Jesus says, no, it's not without a cause. They hated me without a cause. They'll hate, me, they'll hate you because they hated me. In other words, people will hate you without a cause. You have to understand that. That's what it is to be a Christian in, 20, in any century. Mm -hmm. So David understands that. He comprehends, I've got enemies. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's his great difficulty with Saul. Because he's anointed and they yeah. know it. And... Yeah. This is quite important for us because all the way through the saul David saga, what we're actually seeing is Saul is pursuing him and David doesn't really understand why. Except that he calls upon God to judge between him and me. And he wants God to avenge him. Because he feels very, un, well, he feels very un, un, unhelped, to put it mildly. He feels oppressed. And what he wants is, I, I want to be delivered, and I want that to be the case. We saw, I don't know why it's so, but it is. But I'm anointed, he's anointed, I'm not going to touch him. He seems to be quite happy to touch me. Well... Lord, you'll need to care for me because that's the situation in which we are. So should we read ourselves as the anointed in the same way that David and Saul were? Well, that's, quite, that's the great dilemma of all Christians, isn't it? Uh, if you were an Anabaptist mm -hmm. in the 16th century and 
the Catholics were murdering you at high speed and in great numbers, drowning you constantly under pressure of war, you would say, I have enemies. Mm -hmm. And these enemies are my brothers, they say. Mm -hmm. uh, that's David with Saul. He knows mm -hmm. that Saul is the anointed of, of God. David's the anointed of God. They're at war. And what will be the position with the kings once the, once, once the kingdom splits into Judah and Israel is constant war at some times, not always, but sometimes. So what can we say? Can people who are equally anointed of God find themselves opposed? That's your Second World War in general. And, uh, in the, can I defend the Second World War? Wouldn't the, uh, the Germans would have had the six million Jews that they'd slaughtered mm. on their heads? Wouldn't that have been a failing there? Would have God looked upon that as his people that have been slaughtered in the gas chambers and where we hadn't gone down that track? Would we had more favour? I'm asking well, that Well, question. no, it won't be to do with that. I, don't, I, I understand where you're going. <coughs> but it won't be to do that God thinks is more righteous than they. What we'd say is we're all sinners together and each is accorded, each is accountable for what we do. And the question is, does God judge nations in the same way that he judges individuals? Jesus seems to imply no. Sheep and goats, left and right. And they don't even know why. Because they didn't see when his people were there. Remember that? He says to them, sheep Sheep and goats, Matthew, was that? Matthew 25. And they say, well, when did we see you and in prison and didn't help you? And his answer is, inasmuch as you didn't do it to these, my sheep, you didn't do it to me. In other words, what you haven't understood is, I've got a quarrel with you because you have handled them badly. These are mine. And so the judgment of nations is with respect to whose are mine. What, 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 has, what, has, what, has, what have nations done with God's people, ancient or modern? But what about leaders of nations? Aren't they accountable to God? They are for their, they are for their positions, aren't they? Because they're there to govern, which is to care, in, in the context of that. So that's personal. Is that a personal thing? Oh, yes, because every governor who has executive command uh, is in a place to make a difference, did he or didn't he? This is something God will speak to him about. But judgment of nations is about handling of other peoples. How are we then, welcome? But then Hitler and leadership, they weren't God-fearing people. I mean, they were... No. But they would have been... Got to be a that people in Germany probably <coughs> still went along with Indeed things. they were. Mm. But there's also those that opposed. Indeed. So, so then you've got a nation that's... Divided. Yeah, mm. very divided. But, and mm. the leadership is not of God. No, no. that's right. So, but then they're all in the same nation. Mm. Mm. Uh, and so you had a whole set of people who said, well, we're going we're gonna to help Jews. Mm. At the cost of our life, probably, but yeah. we will. Uh, well, then they did. And they did. Yeah, and they did. Mm. Yeah. So, so individual people understand that. Nations, however, are called with reference to their recognition of God's people. But who knows who are God's people? There's a blindness there. So, so we just need to... Uh, what we're establishing... We should stop now. What we're establishing is that it's very important when you read the Psalms to understand what is the setting, what is the picture, what is the scenario, and what is the immediate issue. Because you can call upon God to help you in your immediate issue. We, each of us does it every day. Each of us does it knowing that we're not always 100% right. And certainly knowing we're not perfect. Because sinners can have relationship with a holy God now, by virtue of the blood of Christ. And so it's really important for us to understand that. we we're not in doubt that God loves us. But if we call upon him to judge between us and our, our enemy, we, we need to be sure that they are not ours because... Well, sorry, we need to distinguish ours because his, and they're not his because ours. My enemies 
are mine, as I perceive them. They may be God's enemies, and therefore they may be my enemies because they're his. In Jesus' case, all of them were. It's interesting, though, when it, the way that Paul in Corinthians speaks to the brethren that are in disagreement, mm. brothers, and you know, the whole thing with yeah. courts and so on. Yeah. Um, in terms of ethics, it's how do you counsel a brother that, that is obviously being wronged? Yeah. The person that's doing the wrong thing by him. He's definitely a brother. Mm. Um, yes, and I think, <coughs> and the steps seem to be, aren't they? Go and speak privately. You may well win your brother by your own argument. Mm. Uh, if not, take mm. someone else uh, who agrees with you about this matter. And if they don't listen to them, well then Bring it before the church and so I think this is not right and I, I want the church to express that. What you mean by the church will be an immediate existential group. You can't gather the universal church. Only Jesus does that. But that would raise certain questions as to whether the rest of the group themselves would even recognise what you're talking about. So, and that's... And that's an important problem, which, of course, the Reformation was about. Tonight, then, we've opened three important issues. Abigail is someone who has a wisdom in an existential moment when her husband is really uh, living consistently with a foolish set of ways of living and is absolutely undiscerning and is self-referred and when asked to meet an obligation to David, who has protected his flock, he doesn't even know. And David seems to understand that because he said, if you don't know, ask your men. Okay, You're... could that be wisdom or could she have actually heard through the power of the Holy Spirit? Because the Spirit of being Abigail? Well, she heard from the young men. The young men reported it to her. They actually went round the navel yeah. and said to his wife, ah, this is what happened. You weren't here, but... She, and she just says, she's, she's up and going. She's got a mind. She knows what to do. So her absence was the issue. 